All right, so this is the math calculator portion of Khan Academy test one. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. I try to get um, as much as I can done in the shortest amount of time. So if you, if you missed something, pause, go back, and yeah, let's get going. All right, so looking at question one, it says John runs different speeds. Uh, as part of his training program, the graph shows his target heart rate at different times. So if you read the graph, it's like we said, this is time, and this is his target heart rate. Um, and it says on which interval is the target heart rate strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing? So strictly increasing, then strictly decreasing. So um, I'm just going to look at the intervals and see which one I, I, I think might be the answer. Say so 0 to 30. So no, it looks like it's increasing and then constant. From, from 0 to 10, it's increasing, and then it's constant. So that's not increasing and decreasing. Let's look at 40 to 60. 40 to 60 looks pretty promising, right? It goes increasing, then decreasing. I could look at the other choices, but I'm pretty confident it's B. Moving on. Number two, if Y equals KX, where K is constant, Y is 24, when X is 6, what's the value of Y when X is 5? So this is a K, find K, and then use that value to find um, Y when X is 5. So if Y equals KX, and it says Y is 24 when X is 6, then I can divide by both sides by 6, I get 4 is K, so I know that my equation is Y equals 4X, so then what's the value of Y when X equals 5? So X equals 5, so Y equals 4 times 5, which is 20. So, moving on. Number 3, uh, first geometry question in the figure above, lines L and M are parallel and S and T are parallel. If the measure of 1 is 35, what's the measure of 2? So this is kind of a, um, so you got corresponding angles here. Um, you can go this angle and this angle are supplementary. But I know that if angle one is 35, I could just look at angle two and be like, that's gonna be the supplement of 35. Uh, you could do that a few ways. Again, corresponding angles. These are same side exterior angles. If you get there, um, you could you could do an, a lot of things with this. But the idea is one and two are supplementary, which means that two has gotta be 180 minus 35, and that's 145. So again, with this one, you can almost just look at it. This one clearly is obtuse. This one clearly is acute. So you're not going to have the same thing. You're going to have supplements, and that's the way that that one works. Number four, 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14. What is the value of 8x? So 16 plus 4x, just start writing this, is 10 more than 14. So that's um, 24, <laughs> right? So 10 more than 14 is just a fancy way of saying four, 24. What is the value of 8x? So basically, this is just the find x question, which is 2. So then 8x equals 8 times 2 or 16. So just kind of playing around with numbers with that one. That's just like a play around with your numbers. So that's page one, page two. All right, number five, it says, which of the following graphs best shows a strong negative association between D and T? And what they mean by negative association is basically a negative slope. So the pattern indicates that the, the relationship indicates a negative slope. So A indicates a negative slope, but not a strong indicator. It's pretty dispersed, right? B is pretty constant, pretty flat. C is positive, right? And then D would be the answer because that's clearly going to be a negative slope and it's pretty strong and the, the points are pretty packed together. All right, number six. It says a hospital stores one type of medicine in two decagram containers based on the information in the box above. How many one milligram doses are there in one in a one two in one two decagram container? This is a conversion, right? So I want to convert two decagrams. Um, DCG, I think, uh, into milligrams, right? So if I take two decagrams, and you kind of you could do this the chemistry way, you could do this, you could do this a number of ways, but two decagrams, I'm gonna convert decagrams into grams and then grams into milligrams. So decagrams, so one decagram, again, you want to put the decagram on the bottom so it cancels, is equal to 10 grams. And then one gram is equal to 1000 milligrams. So what you got there is you got the canceling of the units until you got milligrams. So it's two times ten times a thousand. So that would be uh, twenty thousand. Doises, do, doses. Okay. All right, on to page three, number seven. It says the number of rooftops with solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. The total number of installations is 27,500. What is an appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? So this one um, is basically trying to get you to see, like, what is that y axis supposed to be labeled if there are 27,500 installations? So I'm just looking at this, and if there's 27,500, um, let's just say this is 9,000, this is 5,000, and then I'm thinking like this probably would add up to 27,000. If I do a quick adding, I get 10, 
18, yeah, so that's 27,000. So it's pretty darn close to 27,000. So I know that the y-axis should be thousands of units if the total number of installations is 27,500. So number of installations in thousands would be my answer. On the number eight, what value, this is for what value of n is n minus one absolute value plus one equal to zero. And here's a uh, kind of a trick question. There is no value, right? You can't add anything inside the absolute value bars. You can't make, this can't be negative, right? So that's why this cannot happen because negative, right? So it can't be negative, whatever's inside there because I, I can't, uh, and that's the only way to make this equal zero. So therefore it's, there's no such answer. All right, so let's look at, uh, so questions nine and 10. So on this one, you're gonna use this information for two problems. It says, you got this speed of a sound wave in air, which depends on temperature, given by this equation right here, where A is the speed of the sound wave and T is the air temperature. So some important information about the equation. First problem number nine says, which of the following expresses the air temperature in terms of the speed, wave, the speed of a sound wave? So it's basically asking you, you can look at the choices, even if you're not sure which one, what that's asking. The choices tell you all I'm trying to do is, is solve for T. So I got A equals 1052 plus 1.08 T. Subtract 1052 from both sides. Divide by 1.08, so I get A minus 1052 divided by 1.08. So I won't do that quickly, but you can kind of like do the steps, which is subtracting 1052 from both sides, divided by both sides by 1.08, and you get uh, A equals, A, T equals A minus one, uh, 1052 over 1.08. All right, number 10 also uses this information about the speed of the sound wave and air temperature. <clears throat> it says, which of the following air temperatures will the speed of sound wave be closest to 1,000 feet per second? So again, the equation is, I'll just rewrite it, but basically they're telling you the 1,000 feet per second is the speed of the sound wave, which is going to be A. So this question is essentially just asking you what, at what temperature is the speed of a sound wave 1,000 feet per second? And you can see that all the choices are negative because it's like less than the normal. So this is just a solving equation problem once you set it up. So then I get negative 52 equals 1.08 t so i'm going to pause and do my computations and i end up with t once i divide both sides by 1.08 t equals 48 negative 48.15 so which of the following is closest would be b all right on to number 11. so this one asks you which of the following is not a solution right capital not that's going to be helpful uh to the inequality so there's a couple ways you could do this you could take all of these and plug them in you know, to see which one gives you a statement that's not true. I'm going to try to solve the inequality for x and then see which one doesn't fit. So let's take that. Let's do that. So I'm going to subtract 3x. And I like to keep the x positive because I don't want to have to flip the sign. If I, if, I keep, if I have a negative x, I'm going to have to flip the sign. That kind of messes me up sometimes. But I'm going to add 3 to both sides. And I end up with negative 2 is greater than or equal to x. You can rewrite that as x is less than or equal to negative 2. So which one is not a solution? So out of these, x is less than or equal to negative 2. That's a solution. That's a solution. That's a solution. A is not a solution. You could plug it in to confirm, but number 11 should be A. 12, you got a table. It says there are 12 apples represented in this table. So there's, um, it's like a histogram. So the frequency of apples that have that number of seeds so there's two apples that have three seeds there's four apples that had five seeds there's one apple that had six seeds so you can see like the, the the histogram is telling you the frequency of how many apples had that many seeds so seven seeds two apples and nine seeds three apples so based on the histogram which is closest to the average so this is one where i'm going to list out all the 12 apples so i got two threes i got four fives I got one that has six seeds, I got two that have seven seeds, and I have three that have nine seeds. So you should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 apples in that problem. So now I'm gonna find the mean, which is the sum of all the, the values divided by the number of values. So I'm gonna do those computations, I'm gonna add them all up. Uh, so I'm gonna pause and you can do the same, you can do the computations. So I ended up with 73 for the sum of all those numbers, and since there are 12 apples, 
simple mean, you divide by 12, I get 6.08. So which of the following is the closest to the average number of apples would be six. So it's not gonna be exact, but six was, was my answer. All right. All right, so we're looking at this next page. Uh, there's two tables in this page. Number 13 gives you this table talking about males, females, uh, and the course they took and the total number of students. So it says a group of 10th grade students responded to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down into the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all survey respondents? So this one, you know, I'm not really sure until I look at the choices and then I got to figure out is this is this 19% so females taking geometry so females taking geometry represents 53 out of the total 310 so let's just see 53 out of 310 so using my calculator 53 divided by 310 is 17 point or 0.17 17% that's not 19 I'm going to say not a females taking algebra 2 so that's 62 out of 310 probably going to be closer so that's 0.2, not quite 19. Let's see what males taking geometry is. Males taking geometry is 59 out of 310. So 59 divided by 310. And that one gives me my 19. So I'm pretty confident it's C. Males taking algebra 1, 44 out of 310 is 14. So I know it's C. Um, there we go. Number 14, the next one, it's, it gives you this table. Says the table lists the length the nearest inch of random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. If the median, median, mean, median, mo if the mean, median, and range of the values is listed, which will change the most if the if you remove that 24 out, right? So right away, um, I'm thinking the range is going to change the most, but we'll just confirm this, right? The range is the difference between the highest and lowest value, right? So let's see. Um, Let's say with 24, without 24, and let's make a little table here just to organize our thoughts. So we got the range, we got the mean, the median, right? So I'm thinking like, okay, so the range with 24 is 24 minus 8, so that's 16. The range without 24, the, the biggest number would be 16, so that'd be 16 minus 8. So that's a difference of 8. Right, so if I'm thinking about the biggest difference, difference between the range is eight right now. I don't know if I'm gonna get that big of a difference with mean or median, but let's just check it, just to make sure. So then uh, for the mean, I add up all the numbers and divide by the number of numbers. So this takes a minute. If you take a second in your calculator, type them all in, divide by 21, you get your answer. So I'm gonna pause and do that. You could do that the same. So I added them all the numbers. I got 262 divided by 21 gives me a, a, me, a mean of 12.5. If I take out the 24, I get 262 minus 24, so that's 238, but now I'm gonna be dividing by 20, but, and that's gonna give me a mean of 11.9. So that's a difference of less than one. The median is, it might not even change. So median I find by taking the middle, the middle in the set so the mean, obviously, I take the sum of all of the numbers and divide by the number of numbers. The median is the middle. So the easy way to do this is just kind of like cross. Since this set is already ordered, I can just kind of cross off on my way to the middle, you know, each edge at a time. And you can see that the median is going to be 12 with 24. And then it's going to be probably the same, I would guess, without 24. So without 24, it's almost just like doing the same thing, except I don't even have that value. So now when I cross numbers, I start crossing like that. Yeah, so you're going to get 12 again. So the, the median doesn't even change. So the range is going to be the biggest one. Uh, took a second to confirm that, again, when you take an outlier out, that's going to be something you might want to remember that the range changes the most. All right, so questions 15 and 16 refer to the following information. So it says the total cost of renting a boat by the hour given by this chart, this, this XY graph where the X port X axis or the H axis um, is time and the C axis or the Y axis is the cost, right? So first question 15 says, what does C intercept represent in this graph? So this C intercept, again, C is like Y in this case. So what does this point here on the graph represent? So that five represents the cost for just renting the boat. 
and then you're gonna pay based on how many hours. So out of the four choices, C would be the initial cost of renting the boat, right? Not the total number of boats rented, that makes no sense. Not the total number of hours the boat is rented and not the increase either. It's just gonna be like that, that starting off, you pay $5 just to rent the boat and then you're gonna pay a certain amount depending on how many more hours you use it. 16, which of the following represents the relationship between H and C? So this is essentially saying which of these is the equation of the line. So there's two things you need for the equation of the line, which is slope and y-intercept. So the y-intercept we just found, right, we call that B, in this case it's five. And then the slope of this I, got, I could find by counting. If I use the grid, it looks like I'm going up three over four, right? But there's a little bit of a problem with that because if you think the slope is three-fourths, you are right, except for the fact that like that four actually isn't four, that's just one up hour right so it's really up three over one and this is a tricky problem it tripped me up the first time too so if you mess that up it's okay just kind of read carefully and there's gonna be problems like that that are gonna trip you but um, that four again if I didn't write it that's actually one so the slope actually is not three-fourths it's three over one and then when I know the, the y-intercept and the slope y equals mx plus b tells you that um, in this case Slope is 3, and the y-intercept is 5, so it should be C. Uh, commonly picked mistaking question would be B. 17, a complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above. For what value of x is the value of f of x at a minimum? So the, the minimum value of this graph is right here, so what is the value of x when that happens? And I'm just going to make sure the grid is what it is, so yeah, at negative 3. So the, what is the x value where the graph hits a minimum? The x value in that case is negative 3. That's just like a graph um, comprehension question. All right, number 18, you got to, a system-looking thing of inequalities. Solution, it says, if 0, 0 is a solution to the system of inequalities, which of the following relationships between A and B must be true? These are always tricky questions. Um, anytime they ask this, like a general strategy would be plug numbers for variables. Like just randomly pick some stuff, right? So if 0, 0 is a solution, so let's just talk about that. So if I got... That's the only information they really give us. That means if I plug in zero, that A is greater than zero in the first equation, right? So in the second equation, if I plug in zero, zero, so Y is greater than X plus B, right? I got, okay, so zero, so B is less than zero. So those are really the only two bits of information I know. So let's talk about which one of these has to be true. So it says A is greater than B. Uh, yeah, I think that has to be true. That has to be the one because if A is greater than zero, because if this is true and B is less than zero, then A has got to be bigger than B, right? The absolute value of A is greater than B? No, because what if A is like one and B is negative five, right? Then the absolute value of A would be one and the absolute value of B would be five. So that was not true. So actually, yeah, it looks like um, A would be the answer to that. So it's kind of like once you plugged in zero, you didn't have to plug any numbers. Um, to figure that one out, but sometimes you do. Number 19, it says the food truck sells sales for six fifty and drinks for two. The food truck's revenue from selling a total of 209 sales and drinks in one day was $836.50. How many sales were sold that day? So here's a good question. This is a system of equations question. Um, this is a kind of a tricky one, but if you think about like just making up a system, I if you sell salads and drinks and there's 209 total sales and drinks sold, a salad is six fifty. And a drink is two, and you made eight hundred and thirty-six dollars and fifty cents. There's my there's my system of equations, right? So what's cool about this one is you can back substitute to see if it works. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and work this one out because I know how to solve systems. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna try to eliminate the D's because I got I could multiply the top equation by negative two. So that's negative four eighteen. And then I get 650s plus 2d equals 836.5. So that's going to eliminate the d's. Negative 2 plus 6.5 is 4.5. Now I'm going to pull my calculator out. I got negative 418 plus 836.50. So 836.50 minus 418 is 418.5. So you divide both sides by 4.5. So 418.5 divided by 4.5 gave me 93. So how many salads were sold that day? Oopsie. How many salads? 
kind of underlined it, crossed it out, would be 93. So that would be the answer to 19. So good question. And again, these sometimes take a little bit. Take your time. On to the next one. All right, number 20. It says, Elma bought an a laptop computer at a store that gave 20% discount off the original price. The total amount she paid to the cashier was P dollars, including an 8% sales tax, which of the following represents the original price of the computer in terms of P. So she paid P dollars, right? How do you figure out the original price. So P is the price after you take sales tax and a 20% discount, right? So like, let's call the original price X. Right, so if you take the original price, you take 20% off of that, and then you take that and add a sales tax of 8%. So one of the things you gotta remember is when I'm, when I'm discounting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be basically taking less than 100%. And when I'm putting a tax on there, I'm making a, a, a you know, over marking it or making, making the price higher, I'll be multiplying by a number bigger than one, right? So if the original price was X, I first said I'm going to take that number and I'm taking 20% discount. So I'm going to pay 80%. The price I'm paying is 80%. But then on that whole price, I'm going to pay a sales tax of 8%. So that's like multiplying by 1.08. I know you're like, you know, this is just how, how percents work. So that's again, how I'm going to do it. So then if I want to find uh, the original price in terms of P, I could divide by 0 0.8 times 1.08 on both sides. And I can see that the answer for the original price would be P over 0 0.8 times 1.08. That would be D. So that was a little bit of a tricky one, but again, you could also plug and chug, right? Like make up a number for the original price and see if it works out, right? If you know how to do discounts and sales tax on money, if it's just weird because of variables, just make up a value, right? If I say I'm buying a pair of shoes for 50 bucks, right? If my original price, how, how am I going to figure out P in terms of the original price? So you could make up anything really for the original price and see what works. Um, which one of the choices works to get you the right value. All right, so number 21, dreams recalled during one week. You got group X and group Y. So the data in the table above are produced by a sleep researcher studying the number of dreams people recall when asked to record their dreams for one week. Group X consisted of 100 people who observed their early bedtimes. Group Y um, observed later bedtimes. If a person chosen at random is from those who recalled at least one dream, what is the probability that person belonged to group Y? So this is kind of an interesting um, question. So if you pick a person at random from, so this, is, this is a little bit hard because you, your bottom number, if a person chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream. So I'm only picking from these people here, right? So that group, right? If you didn't recall a dream, you're not even part of my, my probability question. So what is the probability that one of these people, 39 plus 25, so add that together. So out of the, all the people are 125. Out of all of the people, which is 164 people, recalled one dream, at least one dream, right? So one, two, three, maybe five or more, right? So out of that group, what is the probability that that person belonged to group Y? So let's look at that. So out of all of these people, and again, I'm not even looking at this column because these are people that didn't recall any dreams. But if, if you look at that, you're only talking about 11 plus 68. That's 79 people who recalled one dream from group Y. So 79 out of 164 would be my answer. See, it's a good question. It's a tricky one. It's a reading comprehension table question. Read it slowly and uh, do your best. Our next question is a table. 20, 22 and 23 refer to the following information, and it gives you the budgets for different programs in Kansas between 2007 and 2010. So this big table is just telling you some different budgets. And then it asks you some questions. So let's get right into the question. It says, which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agriculture slash natural resources from 2008 to 2010? So there's a couple of phrases here that I want to make sure we, we highlight, which is one of them is average rate of change, which immediately calls to mind uh, slope, right? So that tells me, like, I'm thinking I'm probably going to find slope in this problem, but let's see what we, get, what we got here. So if I'm thinking agriculture, natural resources from 2008 to 2010, average rate of change is like, well, how much is, go, how much is it changing per year? So this would be 
488,106 minus 358,708 divided by the difference in the years, which, you know, I could do this in my head, but I'll just show that, right? So this is like rate of changes, the, the change in a budget over change in time, right? So 488,106, so I'm gonna do those computations. I'll pause, you can do the same. So that gave me 129,398 over two. I'm gonna do that computation which gave me $64,699. So how, which one best approximates would be B, about $65,000 per year that's going up, all right? Number 23, of the following, which program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget is closest to the human resource program's ratio of its 2007 budget to its 2010 budget? So this is a weird question. So the ratio, of the 2007 budget to the 2010 budget is closest to the human resources, right? So 2007 budget for human resources is 4,051,050. So I'm gonna take the ratio, and this is, a, this is just a straight calculator, start plugging things in your calculator question. So I got 4,051,050. So the ratio of 20, 2007 budget to this budget is a fraction, right? Ratio is a comparison of numbers with division. So I'm going to put that into my calculator. Pause and do that. Which gave me a, um, a reduced ratio or simplified decimal in about 0.684. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take my calculator and I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to divide this number by this number in each of these categories for Kansas's um, for the state of Kansas, right? So I'm gonna take each of these and see which one is gonna have a ratio that's the same as 0.684. So let's let's just do that. You can pause and start doing that and I'll tell you when, and I'll come back when we find it. All right, so I calculated all the ratios between 2007 over and divided by 2010 and I got 0.766 for agriculture and natural resources, 0.71 for education, 0. 9.7 for general government, highways and transportation was 0.82, and public safety was 0.56. So which was closest was the question. It didn't ask you which one was the same, right? None of them are the same. But the one that's closest would be the education one. So that was my answer. So it took a minute for me to get those computations, but just keep yourself organized. Um, you should be good. Right, on to the next one, number 24, which of the following is the equation of the circle in the XY plane with center 0, 04 and radius of n.4 thirds 5. So this is just a, you know, do you know the equation of a circle question. The equation of a circle, if you recall from geometry, or I think a little, we do this a little bit in algebra too as well. So you got um, the center is the point HK, and the radius um, obviously is the radius, right? So, but the radius squared is the way the equation is given. So when I do this problem, I'm gonna put my center in there. So it's gonna be X minus four thirds, I'm sorry, center is zero. So it's going to be x minus zero squared, which I don't even need to write the zero, it's just going to be x squared, plus y minus four squared equals the radius squared, which I got to figure out the radius. So let's do that next. So in order to find the radius, I got to figure out the distance between zero, four, and four thirds, five. Another way you could do this is use this as the xy coordinate to find r squared and then solve for r and then plug it all together, right? So but right now, I'm going to basically narrow my choices down. I know it's going to be x squared plus y minus 4 squared equals something squared. So right off the bat, I'm like, it's not that one, and it's not that one. So I'm a 50-50 shot, even if I'm not sure how to find the radius at this point. <clears throat> I got a 50-50 shot of guessing correctly because I know how to put the center into this equation. But let's do the next step. So if I use that point, that 4 thirds 5 as x, y. Then I'm going to be able to solve for r. That's the idea, right? So I plugged in that point. 4 thirds is uh, 16 ninths. When I uh, take this square of that, I got 5 minus 4 is 1 equals r squared. So that's going to be um, 25 ninths equals r squared. And actually, I want r squared. So it would be a because I want the equation that is going to be x squared plus y minus 4 squared with r squared, which we know just found is 25 ninths. So we don't actually have to find the radius. We just want an r squared for the equation. It's a little bit of a tricky question, but if you know how to put it in there, you'll get it to narrow down to, to two choices. Number 25. 
So the next one gives you this equation for the height, negative 4.9t squared plus 25t. So it expresses the height in meters of a ball t seconds after it's launched vertically upward with an initial velocity of 25 meters per second after, after approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground. So essentially you're just trying to fi figure out when is h equal to zero. So this is a good physics question, parabolic flight, all that stuff. So when does this equal zero? So this is a solving question by factoring out a greatest common factor. So in this case, <clears throat> I'm gonna factor out a negative t. So it's 4.9t minus 25. So it's at the it's on the ground, right? At zero product property suggests now it's like, okay, so negative t equals zero. So therefore I got t equals zero. So it hits the ground at zero. And then 4.9t minus 25 equals zero. So this is the equation I'm trying to solve. So divide basically 4.9 into 25. So 25 divided by 4.9 is 5.102. So it says which of 5.102. So which after approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? So after about five seconds. Our next question was 26. Is Katrina, Katarina, sorry, is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. So you notice that type A trees produce 20% more pears than type B trees based on Katarina's observation. If the if type A trees produced 144 pears, how many pears did type B tree produce? So if if type A produces 20% more pears, then 144 is equal to 20 like is equal to 20% more of the of the output of type B, right? So you could divide by 144 by 1.2. Um, so it's like using the decimals. You know it's got to be less, right? So out of the choices, you're like, well, if it's 144 for type, uh, if, if type A trees produce 144, how many did type B produce? You know, it's like, it can't be more. Type A is producing more, right? So it's got to be one of these. So in this case, 120 was the answer. 27, a square field measures 10 by 10. 10 students mark uh, each Mark off randomly select the region of the field. Each region is a square that has a side length of one meter and has no two regions that overlap. The students count the earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface. The results are shown in the table below. Okay, so you got 10 regions and each, each person counted the earthworms in that region. So which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to, to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface for the entire field? Okay, so reasonable. So you, one way you could do this um, is looking at all of the data. I'm just going to take... And for the sake of time, reasonably, there's about 150 earthworms per square meter. You could do a whole, you know, find the mean of it. But looking at the choices, I'm like, they're all using like about 150, right? So there's about 150 earthworms per square meter. And so like 10 by 10, there's 100 square meters, right? So for the field, that's 100 square meters. If there's 150 earthworms per square meter, that would be a good estimate of about 15,000 earthworms, right? So um, another way you could have done this is you say like, well, they only looked at 10 square meters in a 100 square meter field. So you could take the total earthworms they found and multiply that by 10. So if you added all of those up and then multiplied by 10, you'd probably get 15,000 as well. But basically all I did was 150 earthworms Per square meter, there's 100 square meters. So in order to do that, you just add the zeros. All right, so let's look at 28, 29, 30. So these are the last three multiple choice questions before the grid answers. So the first one says that the system of inequalities, y, y is greater than 2x plus 1 and y is greater than 1 half x minus 1 is graphed in the xy plane, which quadrant contains no solutions? So let's just try to graph these. So the first one, let me just graph this one in blue. One half, y equals 2x plus 1 is going to have a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 2. Again, proximate graph. Y is greater means I'm going to shade that graph greater, right? So on that side. I'm going to graph the other one. Y is greater than 1 half x minus 1 is going to y-intercept minus 1. And then 1 half x also positive, but it's a little flatter. It's going to look something like that. So if it's greater than that, I'm going to shade above that line. And you can see like that purple region is the solution. 
So the only quadrant in which that purple region does not touch would be quadrant four. So the answer would be like quadrant four. That one contains none of the solutions. All the solutions are in this part, right? The solutions, I don't know if it's spelled that way. Okay, 29, and next question. This is for the polynomial P of X, the value P of three is negative two. Which of the following must be true? So it's not which of the following could be true, it's which of the following has to be true. So P of three equals negative two is the only information they give us. All that means is that this point is on the graph, right? I'm not gonna be able to draw any conclusions about factors. Again, a factor is, is, a num is a value or a binomial that divides evenly into the polynomial without a remainder. So you can't prove anything about being a factor, actually. The only thing that um, is true is that remainder theorem. So if you guys remember when you're talking about the remainder theorem, you got synthetic division. If you, pl if you wanna plug a value into like some polynomial, um, you know, top line is the polynomial, do synthetic division, the remainder, in this case, would be negative two, and that's the solution to plugging in. So that's just like a question about, do you know the remainder theorem? Have you seen synthetic division? But again, based off process of elimination, there's no reason to think any of these is, is more valid than the others. So out of the four choices, the only one that really makes sense is D, because um, the other three are kind of the same. All right, last one. This is 30. It says, which of the following is, e is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph shown in the xy plane above um, from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? So this is a good question if you, you, know, if you take an algebra 2. Three forms of an equation. There's standard form. That's what that looks like, x squared minus 2x minus 15. Uh, vertex form, which is right here, and then you got um, intercept form. So intercept form would be like A and B, vertex form would be like D, and then standard form is the one they gave us. So basically, I think they're asking us for which one of these is ver the correct answer in vertex form. And so like looking at that, because of this point here, it looks like it's it's got a vertex of 1, negative 16, I'm thinking it's D, but let's just make sure that that is equivalent to X squared minus 2X minus 15. So I got X minus 1 squared minus 16. So this is X squared minus 2X plus 1 minus 16. So yeah, so that's X squared minus 2X minus 15, which is the exact same thing as I got. And the vertex is represented as constants, right? So that's the trick with this one, right? I think there are a couple, like I think this is equivalent, but this one has the constants um, of the vertex. That's why D would be the answer for 30. So um, hopefully that was good. All right, on to the grid in responses. So these ones, don't you don't have the luxury of having the multiple choices to guess from. You have to come up with the answer on your own. So, number 31, this is why it can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour and at most 18 dozen ears of corn per hour. Based on this information, what is the possible amount of time and hours that it could take Wyatt, Wyatt to husk 72 dozen ears of corn? So, um, there are several answers to this question, right? What, which is, what is the possible time? So, let's look at the question and see if we can figure out one possible time. So, if he can do 12 ears of corn per hour, so there's going to be a, a boundary here. So, so, 72 divided by 12... six so it, it might take them six hours but 72 divided by 18 on the low end is four hours so um so this one would just be four or five or six hours right so there's a lot of there's sometimes questions that have multiple answers it says which you know what is one possible way um that you can have that so 32, the, the posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge at Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying X identical boxes, each weighing 14 pounds, will, will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum possible value for X that will keep the combined weight of the truck, driver, and boxes below the bridge's posted weight limit? Okay, so you got a 4,500-pound truck that needs to stay under 6,000 6, pounds. Um, so that's 4,500 pounds. So you got 1,500 1500 pounds. Uh, to work with. So if you want to add a certain number of boxes that are each 14 pounds each, you want to keep that under. So the weight limit 
You want to keep that under 6,000, right? So we're finding out, so it says, what is the maximum possible number for x? So basically, I want to figure out what makes this equation essentially zero, because then I'll figure out how many boxes I could use at a maximum. So I end up with 14x is less than 1,500. So I'm going to do my computation. I'm going to pause. When I divide it, I got x has got to be less than 107.142857 or whatever. So x has got to be less than that. So the maximum number of boxes would be 107 boxes. So again, you might want to take your time, check your work, go through it, but 107 boxes would be the max. And on to 33, you got a chart here, a line graph. It says the number of portable media players sold worldwide each year from 2006 to 2011. According to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008 is what fraction of the number sold in, in 2011? So, so this is... um question of reading the graph and then coming up with like what fraction of that that's gonna be a little bit tricky we'll, th we'll talk about that but 2008 there were a hundred million and then 2011 there were 160 million so what fraction of 160 million is 100 million so that would be a hundred out of 160 you could take a um, yeah, 20 out of each. So you do this with your calculator too. You get 100 over 160 in math, enter, enter if you have a TI-84. But take a 20 out of each. Um, the total number of media players or media portable media players um, sold in 2008 is 5 eighths the number of media players sold in 2011. So the answer would be 5 slash 8. So when you grid that in, you just got to bubble in that slash. Okay indicating a fraction. So number 34, the local television station sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. The station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week. What is the total number of 30 minute slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? Okay, so Tuesday and Wednesday, if you operate 24 hours a day, that's, this is just a question of reading comprehension. That's 48 hours of time you gotta fill and you can sell 30 minute time slots. How many, how many can they sell for that? Will that be times two? So because there's two half hour sections in 48 hours, so 96 would be the number of slots. So that one is a, uh, pretty straightforward. Lot, some of these questions are easier than, you know, you might initially think, especially because they're requiring you to, to provide the answer. All right, number 35. So 35 is the first one where I'm, I'm going to have to use my my chart. So if you refer back to the original page, so pause, look back, I'm going to pull it in here and I'll show you. All right. So I pulled this formula sheet from the front page. So again, so there's going to be one question on the SAT that's going to ask that basically going to ask you something you can use this formula sheet to, to help you with. So in this problem, I'm going to use this cylindrical. So it says, a dairy farmer uses a storage silo in the shape of the right circular cylinder above. If the volume of the silo is 72 pi cubic yards, what's the diameter of the base? So I'm going to look at volume. Okay, so here we go. So I'm going to use this guy right here. The volume of a cylinder is pi r squared height. So that's going to be helpful if I didn't know that already, right? So pi r squared h equals 72. So the question isn't what is the radius, it's what's the diameter. So once I find the radius, I'm going to have to divide that. We'll see that in a second. In this case, I know the height is 8, so I'm going to plug that value in right now before I continue. And then I could divide both sides by 8 pi, okay, because I can cancel the pi out here, cancel the 8 here, and then I'm left with r squared equals 9. And that's going to tell me the radius is 3, but it didn't ask me for the radius. So even if you did all that right, if you goof up and you write 3, the diameter actually is the thing I'm looking for. So that's 6. So just be careful with that. 36 says, for what value of x is the function h above defined? So what value of x, oh, sorry, is undefined. Sorry. So what value of x is the function undefined? So again, I was kind of going, it was a lot of values to make it defined, but yeah, undefined would be make the denominator zero. So I need to figure out what, because I can't divide by zero. So if I get one over zero, 
that's undefined. So the question I'm asked here essentially is what is what makes that zero? So I can use my calculator to solve this. I could do this a couple ways. Um, yeah, so this one's a little bit tricky. You could do like a, okay, so there's a, there's a way you could do this. I don't want to confuse you too much, but if, if you want to just kind of re refer to like, if you've seen this before, if you haven't, it's okay. But basically what I'm working with here is like a situation where I got a quadratic on the bottom, but it doesn't really look like a quadratic because I got X minus fives. But if you let U equal X minus five, then I basically got a quadratic here and that's just like U plus two u plus 2 equals 0. So this is probably the easiest way I can think to explain this one. So that's u plus 2 squared equals 0. And I know u is, is x minus 5. So x minus 5 plus 2 squared equals 0. So that's x minus 3 squared equals 0. So the answer to the question would be undefined, would be the value that makes the denominator 0. So what value makes that 0 would be 3. So the answer to the question is x equals 3 makes this graph or this equation undefined. So that's a little bit of a tricky one, but yeah, you could do it a couple ways too. You could try foiling, you know, multiplying these all out and then doing MAF on the bottom. That, that would work too, which would be a little bit more work. I thought that doing the U thing might be the, the quickest way to get there. All right, last two. So you got two questions that use the same information. So it says, Jessica opened a bank account that earns 2% interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was $100. She uses the expression 100x... 100 times x to the t to find the value of the account after t years. What is the value of x in the expression? So this is uh, one of those interest, uh, simple interest equations. So if 100, and if you've never seen simple interest, this is going to be very, very difficult. But simple interest, if you remember the formula, it's principal equals the amount. 1 plus the rate to the t. So this part that they're looking for, this part inside the parentheses, is really just 1 plus the rate, which is 2%, which in a decimal is 0 0.02. So the rate is 0 0.02. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, that thing inside is 1 plus 0 0.02 or 1.02. 0 .02. So the answer to the question is 1.02. So it's kind of like a, if you knew that formula, that question's really easy. If you didn't know that formula, that question's very hard. Okay, Jessica's friend Tyshawn found an account that earns 2.5% interest compounded annually. Tyshawn made an initial deposit of $100 into this account. At the same time, Jessica made a deposit of $100 into her account. After 10 years, how much more money will Tyshawn's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? Round your answer to the nearest cent and ignore the dollar sign when gridding your response. So in this one, um, so you got two situations, one in which you got a person, Tyshawn's going to get 2.5%, Jessica's going to get a 2%. So Let's just kind of go, you got two situations. Ty, Tyshawn's situation, he's putting $100 in <clears throat> at this interest for 10 years, and the years are going to be 10. And Jessica's putting $100 in at the equation from above after 10 years. So again, if you didn't, if you didn't know that equation from above, 37 and 38 are both going to be really hard. You, Yeah, yeah, they're just going to be pretty much really difficult. So at this point... Paul, I'm going to pause and do these computations to see what the difference is. So I plug those into my calculator for Tashawn. He got $128.01 after 10 years. And Jessica got $121.90. So a quick difference. Quick difference suggests the subtraction of these is... Just kind of show what I did. I took this, just subtracted both of them. The difference is six dollars and eleven cents so ignore the dollar sign you would just grid in 6.11 all right i hope this helps obviously go back if i went too fast if you saw something you weren't sure about make sure you you know look back